Uh, we are in 1 Kings 15 and 16, jumping over to uh, 2 Chronicles 14 through 16. We're talking about two groups. We're talking about the northern tribes of Israel and the southern tribe of Judah, which is going to include uh, Benjamin. Remember, the line of Judah is going to be the line of David. There's going to be consistency there. It's going to show up in the culture. They're going to have troubles with idols and high places, but they're going to have a consistency of a family dynasty. It's going to take some pressure off of some political coups and, and rebellions. What I've circled here is uh, the family lines. Same kings as we mentioned last week. I want to read through them this week. But Jeroboam is the one who, who followed Solomon. Uh, of course, over here you had Rehoboam, but Jeroboam was Solomon's foreman. Him and his son are going to reign, and then Nadab is going to be assassinated by Baasa, who's going to reign, I think it's 21 years. And his son Elah is going to follow him, who's going to be assassinated by Zimri, who's going to rule for a week. And then he's going to be assassinated by Omri, and then he's going to have a four, I'll just write four acts, a four generation dynasty here. And the main one we know is Omri and Ahab, and followed by two of his sons. Now at this point, as we said before, there is some infiltration into the line of David where they try to take over this and they actually marry into the line of David. And there's a time where they, it seems like they have a chance of taking over the line of David in, in, in the south. But the priesthood saves the line of David at that time when, when Athaliah the, uh, comes over. Now, after Ace is going to come, right around, well, I'm going to try to get down to this point right here, where you're going to have Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, and Ahab kind of in power right here. And this is the days of Elijah right here. So we're heading down here. And again, Ahab, we know him as a wicked, evil, terrible king. But when you step back outside of the scriptural account, he was evil. He was wicked. He was not a good man. He was not someone that we would want to, you know, follow but as far as being a political leader, as far as being a military person, Omri and Ahab were both very successful militarily. Even the, the ancient writings, uh, the Near, Near Eastern writings from the Assyrians or the Syrians at that time record their names and their household and, their, and the numbers that they took into battle. Uh, Moab was conquered by Omri, and it's, it's found on the, uh, one of the stones, that the inscriptions that they're talking about Omri's household having dominance over Moab. So again, these guys, again, I, we have the Bible records them as they brought idolatry in. They used evil to control their people. Elijah spoke against them. Elijah pronounced a plague, uh, not a plague, but a, a famine on them. But as far as being a political power at the time, these men were good generals. They were good leaders. They had made good political alliances. Not necessarily righteous, but effective. Omri goes up to Phoenicia and has his son, Ahab, marry the Phoenician princess, Jezebel, brings her down, and of course that gives him power. So I mean, what you see happening right here is, is the people of God sometimes are not going to have the advantage of, of choosing to side with evil for political advantages. And these guys didn't care about evil. They sided with evil, they used evil, they were successful in their day, but as the Bible records and as the prophets spoke to them, uh, you're, you're going to be judged for this. They were successful in the world's eyes, uh, but we know them as being evil and wicked. Now again, we're going to have similar things taking place over here in the line of Judah. Hopefully we'll get down to that at this point. Well, I'm going to pray. If you don't have, I'm going to be using the same maps that we had last week. So if you need them, uh, Don's got a few. They're back on the table back there. Uh, and I'm, well, I'll talk about this later. Okay, I'm going to pray and then we'll get started. And I hope I don't do too much review, and I do appreciate your patience as we work our way through these things. Father, we thank you again for the truth you've given to us. We thank you for the word of God that we have before us. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to meet together at this time in history. We ask that we as a people, we as individuals, we as members of the body of Christ would follow after righteous, that we would choose your ways, and that we would be effective as, as we see people in, in the Bible being effective of bringing ministry, bringing truth to their generation. And Father, we ask that we'd be prepared for any kind of a challenge that we have coming in our futures as far as uh, cultural or in, even in our own private lives because of your word that has been sown into our hearts. Again, we thank for the good things you've done for us and ask that your spirit would open your word this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, let's go, please. Uh, I know last week we read, if you go to chapter 15 of 1 Kings, uh, we read uh, in verse 9, we read about Asa. Uh, the, the king, the, the good king that came after Abijah, uh, that followed uh, Rehoboam. 
Uh, we talked about some things that he did about his, his, his grandmother, uh, Mayaka, and different things that he cut down the Asherah pole and put in the Kidron Valley. That's all recorded in 1 Kings chapter 15. Now, uh, we're going to go tonight, after I get done with these guys here, we're going to go back to 2 Chronicles and read this account again that we read in, in 1 Kings 15. We're going to read it in Chronicles. And there's going to be a little more detail there about what's going on in Asa's life. He's going to have some highlights, some low points, but we'll, we'll go there. And that will lead us up to the days of Jehoshaphat. What I'm going to do now is read through Jeroboam and Nadab, father and son, assassinated, son is assassinated by Baasha, and, and Elah is assassinated by Zimri. We'll read through this line of chaos, and then uh, up until the days of, of Ahab. During these days of Jehoshaphat and Ahab, we're going to have some stability as far as political. They're going to even make alliances again with each other. Jehoshaphat is going to make, a uh, jump ahead of the story, he is going to make you know, a terrifying mistake. He's going to allow his son to marry the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. I mean, what, what are you thinking? You're, you're thinking political alliance. You're thinking power. You're thinking this is a wise thing to do. Remember, Solomon, the wisest man in the world, had, had a thousand wives. It's like, why, why do you have so many wives? Well, well they were political agreements. They were their alliances. They gave him stability. And so, again, you can see why they're thinking that. But they're, they're going to use that alliance to move in and undercut the line of Judah. So when you get to Jehoshaphat and Ahab, uh, we're thinking 850 you know, B.C., you're, you're getting some stability in both these kingdoms. Okay, here we go. We're, we're in chapter uh, uh, 15, verse 25. And this first one right here, Jeroboam, you know Jeroboam set up the golden calves. He led Israel, he rewrote their history, gave them new religion, prevented everybody from going back to uh, Jerusalem where they could find the priests, they could find the temple, they could see the things of God, they could find the true history. He, he distracted them so they'd have their own gods, they would never go back. That's going to be a continuous problem of Israel if they would drift down. And remember, the, the southern kingdom of Judah is going to be more stable. So whenever you have all this chaos happening here of Whenever there's the assassination and the overthrow of a dynasty, it upsets the economy, it upsets the culture, it upsets just the stability of, of people's daily lives, and there's a tendency to drift down into this place of stability. And so these guys are always going to have a problem trying to keep the people of Israel from going back to God. Uh, here we go, chapter 15 of 1 Kings, verse 25. Nadab, uh, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa of Judah. Now, one of the, just so you see it right away, I really want to make a big deal about this uh, second year of Asa, because Asa is going to become the king of Judah, and he's going to have a long reign. And several times in, in Chronicles and in Kings, it's going to say the second year, the 31st year, the 15th year. It's like, oh, great, we can kind of correlate these. The problem is as soon as you create a chart in second, or first, second Chronicles of the 5th year, the 32nd year, and then you come back and compare it, you realize you're off about 20 years from 1 Kings. So there it is. It's like, well, what do you do with that? These dates from 1 Kings and 2 Chronicles don't match. And as a Bible teacher, I want to tell you they do. I want to say, well, uh, and there's an explanation for it. For some reason, they don't match. You're going to have, Baas is going to be dead and gone for two decades by the time Asa gets to certain events, and they're not going to match up. So when you get into 2 Chronicles, and when we'll, we'll be there, a couple answers, just to show you this, a couple answers are going to be, they may not be dating uh, from the reign of Asa as much as they're dating from the turning over of the kingdom. Like when, when, uh, when Jeroboam began to reign and Rehoboam began to reign, they may be dating back to that. And it may come across, as they're saying, in the 32nd, you're going to say something like the 32nd year of Asa, Baasa began you know, to build or, or attack on the north side of, of Judah. It's kind of like, well, he's been dead for two decades. How's that happening? Well, if you move it back to where it actually means in the 32nd year of the revolt where this, the kingdoms were split, now it makes sense. So the number fits that way, but that's not what the text is saying. Or you could say it was a copyist there, a mistake at some point that just got copied year after year after year. Uh, or you can say, in, 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 when they say 36, they may be saying 25 or 26, but that still doesn't work. Uh, there's a problem. It's like, that's one of those things, it's like, uh, what's the answer to that? 
there, something's not right. Something's not right. So what does that mean? Well, that means I'm going to leave that on the shelf. I'm going to tell you flat out, it, it doesn't work. There's a, there's, the, there's a problem. You leave it on the shelf. You don't say, well, the Bible's not true. There was never an earth or a worldwide flood because this is, it's like, you don't start throwing out the Bible and say, we can't trust, but it's like, there's something here. Maybe there's not even a mistake. I, it appears there's something going on, but maybe there's not even a mistake. I'm reading, I told some people in church yesterday, I'm reading a book uh, by one of Rob Bell's friends, one of his group there. Uh, but he's, 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 he's trying to get away from all these problems by just pushing off saying, well, you know, in, almost saying it this way, in our wise wisdom uh, of, the, of the 21st century in the Western world, these things, you know, they, we don't have to make sense because they're, they're, they're fictional, they're, they're not important. We're, we're more enlightened than these people are. It's like you've got to be careful going that way because once you start saying, well, we're better than that, you realize if you were in the 1800s and talked like that or in the 1500s and talked like that and now we've progressed, there's things people said over the decades, the centuries that you look back, it's like you have no idea what you're talking about. And when you start making statements, me included, well, I can explain this and the Bible's in air and my, my knowledge and the things that we understand today can prove that this is wrong, realize what you're coming against and do understand that there's going to be more progress made in knowledge and understanding and eventually you're going to be the one that people are going to go like that was pathetic so sad that they thought they had the answer when you really don't know and I have to tell you I'm going to just go with this I, I, I don't know instead of trying to make an excuse and say well these three people are just making stuff up and we're so much wiser than they were we're not wiser than they are. It may at the end come out that they're exactly right, and we just didn't understand what. I don't know how that would fit. I think there's a mistake. That's what I'm. I don't understand it. But I don't want to get to that place where we're trying to to explain the Bible uh, in one of two ways: always defending it to making sure it does. No one's ever questioning it, because again, there are places where it's like it's got to be questioned. We can't figure it out. But you can't, we don't want to go the other way saying, well, it's just fictional, it's just fable, you can't really trust it. But in our wisdom and understanding, this is who God really is. I don't want to leave this behind. Uh, I'm going to leave that, let this be my judge. So anyway, I just want you to see right here, just because we get to this verse right here, I, I wish I would have said that a lot clearer, that in my mind that's a lot more clear and a lot more uh, uh, worth writing down than it came out. But anyway, someday I'll say it right. 1 Kings 15, verse 25. Nadab, son of Jeroboam, became king of Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel for two years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and walking the ways of his father and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. Meaning rewriting religion, rewriting history, and leading people away from the temple, the priesthood, and away from Yahweh. Baasa, son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, plotted against him, and he struck him down at Gibbethon, a Philistine town, while Nadab and all Israel were besieging it. So what you're going to have here is you're going to have generals who are serving under the king coming up and either assassinating the king or leading a coup against the king, and they're down attacking the Philistines. And you can see on one of your maps from last week, it's on the, uh, the first page with just the two maps. No, 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 it's not. It's on the second page with the pictures on it. Yeah, it's one of the first picture there. Uh, they're down in uh, Gibbethon. Israel's army declared... No, that's the same place. It's the second map on the top of the second page with the pictures on the bottom. Uh, that's where Beas, they're down there fighting the Philistines. And it's the same city where Omri is going to uh, be declared king. And Omri is going to be the next general. So, this is General Omri right here who's going to assassinate or lead a rebellion against Zimri, who has assassinated Elah. This is General Baasa, who is serving Nadab, but they're fighting the Philistines down in Gibbethon, and he's going to end up leading, again, a rebellion against him. So, we're in verse 27. Baasa, a son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, plotted against him. He struck him down at Gibbethon, a Philistine town, while Nadab and all Israel were besieging. So you got the northern tribes fighting against the Philistines. The Philistines are still a problem. Baasa killed Nadab in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and succeeded him as king. As soon as he began to reign, he killed Jeroboam's whole family. And this is important because, uh, one, that's, that's how you secured your dynasty. You, you wiped out everybody else from the other dynasty. But also, two, as it's going to say here, it was prophesied by God. Because, Jeroboam, I gave you a chance, 
and you did not cooperate, you rebelled against me, you're done. I'm going to remove any hope of you arising in history as a leader and your family from history. Here's another, here's another thing in that, that particular book that I'm looking at. They try to get away from all this killing. And, and it's like, well, this doesn't sound like Jesus Christ. This sounds, Jesus Christ is peaceful and passionate and, and forgiving and, and walks on water and floats like a butterfly. And, and it's like, no, what? what who, who are you talking about? And they, they try to explain this. I, I think you feel the same, but if, you know, you can feel however you want to. I don't feel like I need to defend this. If God says these people are wicked, I'm going to wipe out your family. It's like, I just got to look at myself, examine my own heart, look around and say, let's stay in, let's stay in tune. It's like, because you've got places where God is wiping out entire pe people like the Canaanites. It's like, what do you do with that? It's like, if, if we would do that today, we would call that genocide. We'd call that immoral. But if God is doing it, I, well, it's against our, our, our governmental policy. It's like... <laughs> That's, that just kind of lets you know where we're at as a culture. We've got a government, we've got a culture, we've got standards. But when we find ourselves looking at God and judging God, saying, God, you can't, you can't judge people like that. You can't destroy entire nations. You don't have the right to just send people to hell. Who do you think you are? It's like, then you begin to realize, wow, we, we may have really drifted as a culture, as a people. That, and we may not even know it. We've drifted so far so fast that we feel like we can sit in judgment of God and his behavior in the Bible, that's not very, that's not the way, we're a lot nicer than that. Now we're setting ourselves up to a position where uh, we're going to be the ones that are going to become evil in, in our judgment. But nonetheless, this is the God's word being fulfilled on Jeroboam and his family. As soon as he began to reign, he killed Jer Beasa, he killed Jer Jeroboam's whole family. He did not leave Jeroboam anyone that breathed, but destroyed them all according to the word of the Lord given through his servant Ahijah, the Shilonite. And remember Ahijah, he was from Shiloh. He was the one who tore his robe and he eventually came up to Jeroboam and says, because you've disobeyed, this is what's going to happen. And here it is. Because of the sins of Jeroboam had committed and had caused Israel to commit and because he provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger, his family was wiped out. It's like, why was his family wiped out? He provoked the God of Israel to anger. He ticked God off. He did not obey. He took matters in his own hands and says, I know you gave this opportunity, but I'm going to do it my own way. God says, no, you're not. I'm going to wipe you and your family off the face of the earth. It's like, oh, man, I, that's, not, that's not the God we follow. Well, you understand what's happening right here? He's like, that's not, we, we follow a kind God. Well, then you've just left the God of the Bible. It's like, well, I don't know what to say. There it is. Okay. <laughs> as far as the other events of Nadab's reign are they, and all that he did are not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. There was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, throughout their reigns. Now, we're going to talk about Baasha. We now begin, this, this is the first dynasty of the northern tribes, now the second dynasty. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasha, son of Ahijah, became king of Israel in Terzah. Now, Terza is a, is a, is the, as you can see on the maps there, it's a, it's a, you can't see it on the maps, the details there, but it's a, it's a good, easy location to secure. It's kind of away from the main highways. Omri is going to eventually move from Terza up to Samaria. It's going to be closer to the, the highways and byways as far as trade. It's going to be easier to invade. It itself can sit up on a hill and have a wall of protection, but it's going to be more accessible for trade, commerce, and getting into the, the cultures of the world. Uh, yet it's also going to be easy to overrun when a foreign army comes. But nonetheless, they're at Terza right now. Um, he reigned 24 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking the ways of Jeroboam, and in his sin, which he had caused Israel to commit. And what is the sin of Jeroboam? I'll say it again. That's, he rewrote history. He recreated religion, made his own priests, or own people priests. And so he took all these matters, religion and, 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 and history, into his own hands and confused the people. And these kings continued. They didn't bring them back to reality. didn't bring them back to truth. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, son of Hanai, Hanani, against Baasha. So here comes another prophet, Jehu. He, God's word to Baasha, who killed Nadab, uh, Jeroboam's son. He said, I lifted you up from the dust and made you leader of my people Israel. But you have walked in the ways of Jeroboam and caused my people Israel to sin and to provoke me to anger by their sins. In other words, God is saying... And you do what you want to, but this way I see it. This family right here was given a chance to lead the people of God back towards God. <laughs> Jeroboam was put in power because of why? 
because of Solomon's sin. It wasn't because Jeroboam decided, I want to rebel against Solomon. The prophet, the same prophet that condemned him, was the prophet who came to him and says, God is going to judge Solomon after he dies. And he's going to give you the northern kingdom. Follow him. Walk in his ways and you'll never lose this. So Jeroboam goes off and sins, rewrites it. He's too afraid to obey the prophet. He's too afraid that there's too much pull. He's afraid the people are going to go back to God and go back to Jerusalem. It's like, and so instead of doing what God wants to do, he tries to keep this king that God gave him for himself and, he, and recreates religion, recreates history. Nadab, his son, follows him. Baasa replaces him. And why does God replace Jeroboam's family with Baasha? So you can lead them back to me. But Baasha says, this is really working well. The people are never going to go back to God. I'll keep them for myself. And thus, here comes the prophet. I gave you this to bring the people back to me. And you stayed here and did it your own way so you wouldn't lose the people. So here comes the prophet. who's going to bring judgment on Baasha. I lifted you up, verse 2 of chapter 16, from the dust and made you leader over my people Israel. But you walked in the ways of Jeroboam and caused my people Israel to sin and to provoke me to anger by their sins. Instead of bringing them back, you just continued the policy that was working, leaving the people live in sin. So I'm about to consume Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. I'm going to destroy you. Dogs will eat those belonging to Baasha who die in the city, and birds of the air will feed on those who die in the country. As for the other events of Baasha's reign and what he did and his achievements, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Baasha rests with his fathers and was buried in Terza. That's the original capital again. And Elah, his son, succeeded him as king. Now he's going to reign, as you can see up there in, in, at the end of chapter 15, he's going to reign 24 years. So there's a whole lot more going on in Baasha's life than just he got put in position and then got judged. He's going to have 24 years, and we're going to see more of that when we start reading about these kings of Judah. Baasha is going to be at war with the kings of Judah. We'll read about that here. We did a little bit last week already. Okay, but now his son Elah is king. Um, verse 7, Moreover, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Jehu, son of Hanai, to Baasha in his house because of all the evil he had done in the eyes of the Lord, provoking him to anger by the things he did and becoming like the house of Jeroboam, and also because he destroyed it. Okay, now his son's king in verse 8. In the 26th year of Asa, king of Judah, Elah, son of Baasha, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Terza two years. So now he's going to continue in that, that the old original capital for two years in Terza reigning, and he's going to follow in his father's uh, footsteps, who followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam, who God put in power to lead the people back towards him after Solomon's fall off, uh, falling away. But Zimri, one of his officials, who had command of half his chariots, so half of his chariots were under the control of Zimri. He's like a general or a chariot leader. Zimri, one of his officials, who had command of half the chariots, plotted against him. Elah was in Terza at that time, getting drunk in the home of Arza. Now, we don't know anything about Arza, but he's the man in charge of the palace at Terza. So the man who's in charge of the palace has the key, has access to everything, and knows where all the wine's at. They're at his house having a party. He's drinking, he's drinking in an attempt to get drunk. Well, Zimri knows this. He's in charge of the chariots. He knows what's going on. He uses this opportunity to come in and kill him. Now, meanwhile, there's a battle going on down in the Philistine against the Philistines at Gibbethon. Once again, that's your next map there. It's going to be the, the first map and the bottom on the left side there. Uh, Omri is down in Philistine territory fighting against the Philistines at Gibbethon. Uh, Elah is getting drunk with his the man that's in charge of the palace. And Zimri, the man that's in charge of half the chariots, sees this as an opportunity. Obviously, he's not down at this battle. Maybe his, his division of the chariots are protecting the northern front. Omri's down fighting on the southern side. Elah's getting drunk or something. Completely, you know, it's almost like the story of uh, Belshazzar. Um, we're in verse 9. Zimri, one of the officials who had a command of half the chariots, plotted against him. Elah was in Terza at that time, getting drunk in the home of Arza, the man in charge of the palace, at Terza. Zimri came in, struck him down, I guess in the middle of the party, and killed him in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah. We're still dating everything off of Asa here. 
Then he succeeded him as king. Hope everything goes well for you, Elah. As soon as he began to reign and was seated on his throne, he killed off Baasha's whole family. So now, Baasha wipes out Jeroboam. Zimri wipes out Baasha's family and Elah's family. That's the first thing he does to secure his dynasty. He did not spare a single male, whether relative or friend. So Zimri destroyed the whole family of Baasha in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken against Baasha through the prophet Jehu. Notice this family is destroyed after the same prophet who told them they're going to receive this blessing from God tells them God's going to destroy you. Baasha is told by the prophet, because you've chosen this, your family's going to be destroyed. So these people aren't being destroyed without a prophet step up and saying, it's over. Both families are told. Um... He goes through and explains that. Verse 14, as for the other events of Elah's reign and all he did, are they not written in the books of the annals of the kings of Israel? There's only two years to write about. Okay, here goes Zimri's reign. Zimri destroyed this whole family. That's about all he had time to get done. In the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Terzah seven days. Just enough time to find out where the wine's at and kill the family of Baasha. And what's next? Oh, my assassination. Okay. The army was encamped near Gibbethon. And that's where Omri, Ahab's dad, is one of the generals. He's down in Gibbethon fighting. Uh, when the Israelites in the camp heard that Zimri had plotted against the king and murdered him, they proclaimed Omri the commander of the army. So by the time the email that Zimri had killed Elah back up in Terza, which isn't that far away in modern times, but by the time the email gets down back down to the Philistine territory, they say, well, we don't want Zimri, the commander of the chariots. You know, we want our own man. We want our own general who's here fighting to be the king. We don't want Zimri who's sitting back with the chariots. We want Omri to be the king. So the whole military just says, forget Zimri. Omri, you're going to be the king. Okay, so Omri, I'm sure he encouraged that. He is a, again, remember, Omri is a great leader. As Ahab, they are great leaders. They're great movers of people. Just because you can move people doesn't make you a righteous individual. Are you with me on this? The Antichrist will be able to move people and sway people, convince people. But it is a talent. It is a gift. Omri is a general. He can command people. And they'll follow him. They honor him. But that doesn't mean he's right. That's just, that's just that, that's the severity of the responsibility a person has that can communicate with people and move them. Okay. Um, Verse 15, in the 27th year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Terza seven days. The army was encamped at Gibbethon, a Philistine town. When the Israelites in the camp heard that Zimri had plotted against the king and murdered him, they proclaimed Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that very day there in the camp. They just made their general king of Israel. Then Omri, with all the Israelites with him, withdrew from Gibbethon. Leave the Philistines for another day. Let's go get my kingdom. Uh, now, this, that's not unusual. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did when he was over here. And we've talked about it in Jeremiah. He was over here in, in Israel fighting and going down the coast, fighting the Philistines, going on in Egypt. Finds out his dad was died. He ends up uh, going all the way back, taking captives, Daniel, Shadrach, Michigan, Abednego, and others from the royal families out of all the people he conquered. goes back and secures his throne and then comes back and finishes the war. So, I mean, if, if he, Omri doesn't go up there, he can't run the country in the middle of a battle. He's got to open, get himself set up on the throne. So, here we go. Uh, verse 70, Then Omri withdrew, all the Israelites with him withdrew from Gibbethon and laid siege to Terza. They're now attacking the capital city. When Zimri saw that the city was taken, meaning he's in there and, He's behind the wall. They got the stone walls. He's got the fortress. He's got the palace, you know. Uh, and he's got some people fighting for him. But when he realizes this is not going to go well, <laughs> the entire army's fighting against me. Uh, when Zimri saw that the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the royal palace. And notice, the ro there's a royal palace, but within the royal palace is the citadel. That's the last stand. That's the fortress. That'd be the tower inside the palace. And they all would have a place like this. And what did he do? And set the palace on fire around him. He just burns the place down. So he died because of the sins he had committed, uh, doing evil in the eyes of the Lord and walking the ways of Jeroboam and then the sin he had committed and had caused Israel to commit. So he gets the same sentence these guys do. And now Zimri, after seven days, uh, his time is done. He had enough time to uh, kill the house of Baasha, you know, move into the palace and burn it down. 
and killed himself in the process. As for all the events of Zimri's reign, what else could you write? And the rebellion he carried out, that would be the rebellion against Elah, are they not written in the books of the Annals of the Kings of Israel? Now, here's Omri. This is Ahab's father. Now begins a period of stability. You're going to have four generations of stability. Not godliness, not you know good things, of, of wisdom, if you want to call it worldly wisdom. He's going to make treaties. He's going to marry his son into the power of the Phoenicians and, and receive their support. He's going to be good in the military. He's a general. I mean, he's, he's able to lead militaries. Okay, but, but again, understand, he's not a good man. I'm not saying he's a good man. I'm saying he's a successful man. Then the people of Israel were split into two factions. Half supported Timni. Now, there's a new name. Timni, Timni, son of Ginnath for king. And the other supported Omri. Now, the very fact we know who Omri is, we don't know anything about Timni, kind of lets you know where the story's going to go. So they're split. you got the Republicans and the Democrats. They both got their own candidate for king. But Omri's followers proved stronger than those of Timni, son of Ginnath. So Timni died and Omri became king. We don't know anything about it, but there must have been some battle there around Terza, and they're fighting for the throne. And Omri, because he's the general, and we got to assume this other guy, Timni, must have been some other military person, but we don't know. Verse 23, in the 31st year of Asa, we're still dating stuff off of Asa, king of Judah. In the 31st year of Asa, king of Judah, Omri became king of Israel, and he reigned 12 years. Six of them in Terza, in the old capital city. But then after six years, he bought the hill of Samaria from Shemar for two talents of silver and built a city on the hill calling it Samaria after Shemer or Shemer, the name of the former owner of the hill. So he's going to buy this hill. It's, 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 it's to the north. You can see on your maps. It's not a detailed map. It shows you. Um, in fact, there's a picture of It's the last map with the picture there. Showing you where, where see, I said to the north. Terzas, you can see where it's at. It's to the, uh, the northeast. Samaria is going to be more down into a, a valley, a place of access, of, of travel and trade. Uh, more on the main lines. Uh, what did I say? <laughs> the hill of Samaria. But that hill of Samaria is, uh, it can be fortified itself as far as having a wall of protection around it. Uh, it has been excavated. And <clears throat> it's going to talk about ivory here in Ahab's day. And, and there's been much ivory found in the remains of this, of, of, of Samaria, of the capital city. So, uh, I, there, there's many reasons to believe these things are historical uh, besides what we've just said. Okay, uh, verse 25, But Omri did evil and in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. Again, because he's going to be more successful. He's going to do uh, uh, better treaties. He's going to actually go across borders and make treaties with people that are completely outside of God's plan. He walked in all the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, and in his, in his sin, which he caused Israel to commit. So, I mean, he supports what has been laid down in the history, the, the false religion, but does even more to bring stability to his own reign. And all that provoked the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger uh, by their worthless idols. As for the other events of Omri's reign and that all that he did and the things he achieved, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Omri rested with his fathers and was buried in Samaria, and Ahab, his son, succeeded him as king. And now comes Ahab. Now, for the first time... In Ahab's reign, there's going to be a battle, that's going to, and this is where the dating really secures. Uh, to put all these things with a date, it, it's hard to date them with secular history. Not impossible, we could, but we can argue about the Exodus, we can argue about the time of David. But all of a sudden, there's going to be a battle where Ahab is going to be, it's going to be described in the Bible, and it's going to be mentioned in secular writings on inscriptions. And it's easy to put a date on it, and at that point, we can now date uh, Bible dates with history and secular dates and we can kind of begin to stabilize and it continues that way all the way up through like there's really not much argument about when Jerusalem fell in, the, in Babylon, uh, Babylon's invasion you can argue about the month or if it's this part of the year or that part of the year but things are pretty secure even in Babylon the chronicles of Babylon are very solid but anyway that we're kind of coming to that place where things are going to be stabilized but uh, let's read about Ahab read up to the end of chapter 16 then we're going to go to chronicles in the 28th year of Asa, okay, Asa, we're getting towards, we're getting towards the end of Asa's reign, uh, king of Judah. All these have been taking place during Asa's reign. Asa is going to face Baasa. He's going to see all these kings come and go. He's going to be there for Omri. He's going to be there for Ahab. In fact, his son is going to end up reigning alongside of Ahab. 
Uh, nonetheless, a Asa's son, Jehoshaphat. Uh, he reigned, in, uh, let, me read, let me read this again, verse 29. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. That's a, that's a very long reign. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. In fact, he's the king that, if we think about an evil king in Israel, we think of Ahab. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, again, having changed religion, having rewrote history, and all the things that Jeroboam did, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of Sidonians, or the king of Phoenicians. He would be king in Sidon, which is uh, the, one of the capitals of Phoenicia. And again, they, they're, they're the Phoenicians who've got access to the Mediterranean world through their shipping, through their trade. They're very wealthy. Their ships have gone, or they've established a Carthage. They've gone up, most likely have gone outside of the Gibraltar Strait into the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, there's, there's reasonable reference to believe they've, they've touched North America and come back because there's no trade there. They've gone down around Africa. These people have great wealth and great trade. They're great seafaring people. And to make a treaty with them taps into enormous wealth, but also a wide range of false religions and, and world philosophies that are contrary to what God would want them to follow. But uh, jo, uh, 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 Ahab also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. Brings Baal in to kind of stand up alongside the golden calves. Now, remember, the golden calves, you need to study this out yourself, but it's not so much that they're worshiping the golden calf, but the golden calf was what the gods rode on. And when you see, you can see images of Baal. He would ride on the storms. He'd ride on the clouds. But he would all, there's images of him standing on the golden calf. If you find the calf, an image of a calf, what that is like finding the Ark of the Covenant. We don't want, the Israelites didn't worship the Ark of the Covenant. They worshiped who? The God who rode on the Ark of the Covenant. The God whose presence was on or in with the Ark of the Covenant. And so when the golden calf shows up, that means there's a God standing on, there's images of this in ancient, from the ancient world, of the God standing and riding on the calf or on a bull. And so when it says he worshiped Baal, or it, it just means that he brought in their form of religion and matched it up with the, 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 uh, the gods that they'd already had of the golden calf. He set up an altar, verse 32, for the Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. So now there's a temple of Baal, don't forget this. There's a temple of Baal in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah, or Asherah pole, and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. He's completely embraced the Canaanite worship, uh, the God of the storms, the fertility God of Asherah, and as you know, this is all true. So now they're, they're gone completely. Now if you count this, you're into one, two, three, four, if you want to. You're, however you want to break this down. But you're moving into a time period here. You've got four different dynasties. You're going to have four generations here of kings. And Elijah's going to come to that right there and he's going to say, enough. You, you have crossed line. In fact, God's going to come to Elijah. Elijah's not going to make it up himself. Um, in verse 34 is an interesting verse that you, you always want to kind of know where this is at. Because remember... When Joshua destroyed Jericho, he pronounced a curse on it, remember? Cursed is the one who builds this. The death of their firstborn will, will build, they lay the foundation stones, or how I can't remember exactly what it is, and another death for the, the, the hanging of the gates. So in other words, when you build, begin building it, you're going to have disaster in your family. When you final, hang the final hinge and the doors or gates are working, you're going to have another disaster in your family. Well, here it is. Uh, we're around, you know, 850 B.C. We're, you know, some, what would you say, 1,200, eight, we're 400, 500 years away from Joshua. In Ahab's day, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. And again, it wasn't supposed to be rebuilt. And again, Jericho is the oldest or one of the oldest cities in the world. It's the lowest city in the world as far as being low. But there's a natural spring of water there. And if you were there, and you can see pictures there, there's palm, it's the middle of the wilderness. It's the middle of the desert, right off the Dead Sea. But there's palm trees all around because there's a natural spring. They call it Elijah's Spring. I foolishly drank out of it just because I had the opportunity, just drank right out of it. Probably shouldn't have done that. That's probably why I was sick last week. But it's like, but I did it. But I mean, you can stand on top of the remains and you see palm trees all around. 
And so to not have that rebuilt, it's the oldest city in the world. It's like it was quite a temptation to not build it. And, but anyway, finally, now, he laid the foundation at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. So it gives, for me, it gives the impression of God says, don't touch this city, and he built it, and God judged his family for that. There's another way of coming around because child sacrifices, there's something to consider here. I'm, I'm not going to promote this, but it, it could be. I need to investigate it more. But that they would offer their son, you know, and when you begin, you dedicate, I, I want the gods to bless me or the god Baal, that you'd sacrifice a son for the city, for the god's favor, and when he got done, you'd sacrifice another son. So he killed son one, killed son two, for the protection of the gods for their city. And that's what, I mean, that's what child sacrifice is. People are sacrificing their children, not because they're crazy, okay? People don't sacrifice their, again, you shouldn't sacrifice your children. I'm not promoting child sacrifices. But the only reason you would sacrifice your child, if you weren't crazy, is you think it's what God wants, whoever your God is. And if you sacrifice your child, I'm actually doing a favor for me, my family, my people, by offering my son. And son, this is a great honor. We're going to give you as a, as a martyr, as a, as a sacrifice to the great God. You can almost see if, if they've been trained properly, if they're good Sunday school boys and girls, they'd be very happy to follow suit and be part of that sacrifice and give their life to make God happy. Again, we're talking about a twisted religion. So it is possible here that it wasn't God's judgment on his sons as much as it was him sacrificing to the pagan gods to bless the city of Jericho. I don't know which way to go with that. There's both talks on both of those. Uh, both of them have a truth to it. God does judge families. But God also, or not God, but there are child sacrifices to bring blessings on. That's what child sacrifice was all about. It's not a bunch of crazy people. It's a bunch of people with a crazy religion. Okay, in the midst of all this, and that might be the thing that tees up chapter 17. If it is child sacrifice, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. You've got to study it some more. Chapter 17. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead. Now you know where Gilead's at. If I were to draw a map right here, if i got any room. Here's Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea. Here's Jerusalem. Here's Samaria, Terza up in this area. Here's the northern ten tribes. Here's the Jabbok. Gilead is over here. There's a city, and Je Elijah is going to come from across here over to Samaria with a word from God. He's coming from Gilead. That's where Elijah comes from. He's coming from over here into the land of Israel. And then we got this great story of Elijah that we've got to pick up. Now, with that being said, we're, we're caught up to where I kind of want to be. we got to jump over here to Asa. If you don't mind, please go to, go to first or Second Chronicles. And we've already read about, we've already read about Asa in 1 Kings. But I want to read about Asa now in 2 Kings and see what's going to take place. And you're going to want to go now to this page of your maps. It's, uh, this, the other page has just got the two maps on it. We looked at it last week. And here we go. The issue is going to be this. Let's get a map up here again. Galilee, Jordan, Dead Sea. Uh, here's the coast. Here's the Philistines over here. The original city, Philistines. Egypt is down here. Uh, Jerusalem, it's out of the picture. Well, it's in the picture here. But there's your border. And Terza and Samaria are up in here. Uh, there's going to be a, a, a battle for this border. Up here on the north is the Syrians. Uh, they're the same, the Arameans or the Syrians, depends on your translation. Uh, they live up here. The Phoenicians lived over here. The Phoenicians are up here. You're going to have the Arameans or the Syrians. Now again, these are not the Assyrians, it's the Syrians. Ben Hadad. There's going to be like five or six Ben Hadads starting here that are going to show up throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Ben Hadad. Then eventually it'll be Ben Hadad the first, Ben Hadad the second. Many of them are accounted for in scripture or in secular writings. They're, this is true. I mean, there we have secular writings of the Arameans. We've got writing or the Syrians. We've got Ben Hadad popping up. So this is, you know, this is we could go spend all this time studying the Ben Hadad family. Baasa is going to be the king here as we begin the story again. We talked about this a little bit. So here we go very quickly. And we're talking about now Asa. 
the king of Judah. So, we're in verse chapter 14, verse 2. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. He removed the foreign altars and the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. Okay, Now, we've read this last week, but we read it in 1 Kings. We're reading it now in 2 Chronicles. If I can make a general statement, Kings is written, it appears by scribes. These are two sets of documents. There are, I mean, it's so, it's so, it's, it's such a fun thing to get into as far as being, you know, attacking the critics. But you've got people writing things down. You've got in the, in the palace of the kings of Judah, even in Israel, you've got the scribes recording the events of the king. There's volumes. We wish the Babylonians hadn't burnt everything. You understand? We wish we still had all those scrolls that we could go back and read through all the things that they'd written down. It was all destroyed. Some of it was preserved. You know, we can find remains that we can find. That's why we find the boule, those, those clay seals stamped with names of royal officials. Because what's all that's left is the clay that sealed the document. The document burned up, but it it, it secured the seal as as far as uh, uh, what do you call it? Gel, not gel, uh, glazing it. So it's it's like now it's a stone. It's a, it's a wax that not wax. It's clay that has been hardened. So there's a lot has been lost. But the scribes in the palace appear to be writing the documents in 1st and 2nd Kings. When you swing over to Chronicles, it's another group of people. It's not the scribes from the palace. It's the scribes in the, in the temple. It's the priesthood. It's the religious leaders. They're writing the same events. But they're writing it from looking from the palace into the government. Where in the, in the, in the, in the kings, they're writing as, as employees of the government, if you would. So it's nice to have two sources. You, know, you always want to check your news sources. Um, now, I'm not attacking the authenticity of Scripture. Absolutely not. In fact, I'm proving the authenticity of Scripture. I'm not attacking the inspiration of Scripture. Okay, as far as, you know, that, it's like, well, you saying men are writing these things? Uh, yeah. It even tells you who wrote them sometimes. Okay. So, Asa did it was right and good. This is from the Chronicle writer, the writers of Chronicles. In verse 4, he commanded Judah to seek the Lord. So when Asa becomes king, contrary to the kings of Israel, saying, seek the golden calves, he's in power saying, seek the Lord. And again, it's Yahweh. Uh, the God of your fathers, and obey the laws and commands. So these guys in the north are fleeing from God. These guys in the south are seeking historically after their God, if they're listening to their king. He removed the high places and the incense altars in every town in Judah. So he's in charge of all that. And we see this in different cities. Uh, we remember seeing the, uh, and I've showed you pictures of in, uh, uh, down south in, uh, uh, what's the name of the city? I just forget the name of the city. Uh, the altar there. What is it? Arad. 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 The, the whole, a whole shrine is there. It was covered up. It appears in Hezekiah's day it was covered up. But, but he's removing all these high places. Um, he built up the fortified cities of Judah since the land was at peace. Because he's seeking God, they've got peace. Notice what he does in a time of peace. He builds up the fortified cities. And there's, we can go through and list the fortified cities. They're on some of the major trails coming in towards Jerusalem. He would fortify them. Uh, no one was at war with him during those years, for the Lord gave him rest. So we're looking at a period, maybe five, ten years, that he could have, have some peace. Let us build up these towns, he said to Judah, and put walls around them with towers, gates, and bars. The land is still ours because we have sought the Lord our God. We sought him, and he has given us rest on every side. So they built and prospered. You're going to have this tension now in the life of Asa where they're seeking God. They're getting peace. They says, okay, God has given us an opportunity. Let's use it. Let's fortify the land. And so far, so good. So far, so good. Uh, there, 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 there is this balance between seeking God, seeking God's way, seeking God's protection, saying, hey, <coughs> we've got an opportunity to, <coughs> to build up our national defenses or whatever. Verse 8, Asa had an army of 300,000 men from Judah equipped with large shields and spears and 280,000 men from Benjamin. So you can add those together, get a number in your mind right here. Uh, 300,000 and 280,000, add that together. All these were brave fighting men. Okay, excellent. He's got himself a decent-sized military. He's had peace, a time to build up the land, fortify the land of Judah. Meanwhile, now you're going to go to that second map. No, no, no. You're going to go to what map? You're going to go to the first map on the second page. 
Zerah the Cushite marched out against them with a vast army. Now the word vast army, some trans, I think the English standard says a million men. The Hebrew says thousands of thousands. So, you know, it, 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 it means a lot of people. It means innumerable people. It means it's bigger than his army. And they march out against Asa, coming up out of Cush. He may have been sent by Shishak. He may be uh, 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 someone that's supported by the Egyptians. But he's coming out of, out of Cush. He's coming from uh, modern-day Libya uh, to fight. Uh, 300 chariots, a vast army, and 300 chariots. Now, again, I'm concerned right there. 300 chariots. You've got that many men. You've only got 300 chariots. It seems like you should have more chariots than 300. Not to be critical, but it's like, okay. But anyway, he's got, I'm not questioning. I'm just saying that seems odd to me. It seems like you'd have 300,000 chariots. But he's got 300 chariots. And he came as far as Marissa. Now, this is where you come in, Tony. Marissa, because I've got a picture right here. Marissa is on your map right there. You can see in that very first map with the pictures on it, there's Marissa right south of Jerusalem. It's Marissa. Marissa is very close to uh, uh, the Valley of Elah, it's south of Jerusalem. It's in that area. It's one of the fortified cities kind of towards the border of Judah. And we were there, a place called bet Gervin. Uh, yeah, Govern. Uh, if you guys remember going to the tomb, the Sidonians' tomb. Remember, these are the Sidonians. Uh, this Marissa... This Marissa was uh, uh, destroyed, that, that he's talking about right here, he went as far as Marissa. It was a fortified city destroyed by Sennacherib, like when he destroyed Lachish and those other places, in 701 on his approach to Jerusalem. And then, he, then his whole army was killed by the angel of the Lord, and he retreated. But Marissa is going to be destroyed in 701 along with Lachish and Ezekiah by Sennacherib. So it's going to last until 701. It was then going to be rebuilt, oh, oh, say after like 40 B.C. or so by the Romans, uh, and it's going to be called bet Govern in, in a suburb of about two miles north is going to be rebuilt. And this is now Tony standing in the tomb of the Sidonian king that had come down here, and that was part of their territory that they were, they were ruling at that time because Judah had fallen. And she's standing in, we got, I got a picture of Larry. We were all in there. Larry, I got a picture of Larry. Do you guys remember this tomb? Anyway, just, just there it is. Just pass that around. Let's just, just want Tony to be part of class tonight. But just so you kind of get a perspective, that this, this city, uh, Marissa, is right about here. And so the Egyptians came up as far as, or the Libyans, they came up as far as Marissa. You can see on that map, correct? You understand what I'm saying? I'm just trying to give you a, a, a foothold and show you a cool picture of Tony standing in a tomb. Okay. Zerah the Cushite marched out against him and a vast army and 300 chariots and came as far as Marissa. So he's up into the fortified cities of Judah, very near where David killed Goliath. Asa went out to meet him, and they took up battle positions at the valley of Zephath, Zephathah near Marisha. Now, I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, what else are you going to do? But So he goes out with his army, matches up man to man against him. Then Asa called to the Lord, the God, his, his God, and says, and this, this is the key point, he's built up his forces, He's, he's asked God for peace. He sought God. Now he goes off and meets this Egyptian force, or the Libyan coming up. He says, Lord, there is no one like you to help the powerless against the mighty. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rely on you, and in your name we have come against this vast army. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Now then, it says, the Lord struck down the Cushites before Asa and Judah. The Cushites fled, and Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gera. And again, that's marked on your map there. They're going to pursue them as far. Remember when Abraham was digging wells and things? They're going to pursue them down here in the Philistine territory, and they're on a dead run back home, leaving behind the land. So they come up into Israel, and they are Judah, and they drive them well out of Judah and pursue that far. And, of course, there's dead bodies, and there's armor, and there's weapons, and and, you know, like I say before, VCRs and television sets scattered all the way down into Egypt. They're picking all these things up. Um, it says, such a great number of Cushites fell that they could not recover, and they were crushed. He crushes this national army. Uh, the men of Judah carried off a large amount of plunder. They destroyed all the villages around Gera, for the terror of the Lord had fallen upon them. Sounds like the days of Joshua. They plundered all these villages since there was much booty there. They also attacked the camps of the herdsmen and carried off droves of sheep and goats and camels. Then they returned to Jerusalem. So it appears the reason 
these Libyans or the uh, they came up this far is these people were cooperating, letting them come through. So on their way of, of driving it out, they just stopped and plundered everybody that supported the invading army and plundered them and took their, well, took everything from them. Now, that's a great story about Asa. You can see the, the balance between being wise, you know, having some strategy, building up your fortresses, and seeking God on the front end and on the back end. Okay, chapter 15. Very important point. The Spirit of God came upon Azariah, son of Obed. Here's now another prophet. Going to come and explain to Asa what just, what just happened. Well, here's what just happened. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, gives the impression upon their return, the prophet goes off to meet Asa to tell him, hey, here's a breakdown from what just took place. Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. Now notice how Judah and Benjamin are together now. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he'll be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. That's a great, that's one of my favorite verses. That goes way back to my, my early days. I was born again Christian, but I go back to 1983, 84, 85, when I kind of decided, should I seek God? What do I do? Then I, I didn't really understand some things. I read several verses like this. It says, you will find him when you seek him. It's like, so I'm not wasting my time. If you seek him, you will find him. It's kind of like, and I took that, this verse and other verses like it, and that, that's kind of where I began my journey with the confidence of, well, because sometimes you, you step out on these spiritual journeys, just like, uh, what's out there? And you look around and, and you don't know what, it's like, am I wasting my time? Uh, this verse right here says, here it is. Listen, if you go look for him, he's waiting for you to look. You ask, you will receive. You seek, you'll find. You knock, the door will be open. Do you want to meet God? Well, yeah. Well, do something. I'd like to meet God. I said, do something. <laughs> it's like, well, can he come? Down? He's not going to come meet you. You're going to go get him. You understand? Now, there's that, you know, that, what, I thought about, what about grace? There's that thing about God doing things, but there's also that thing that we see all the way through the New Testament. You can't get away from it. God, Peter, we just went through 1 Peter, we're doing through 2 Peter. There's God has done, now you go get. There's this balance. Of, uh, God's done his part. Anyway, the, the prophet comes out and tells Asa the same thing. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, the prophet continues, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. I love, love that verse also. What was their problem? A long time Israel was without the true God and without a priest to teach. Now, they may have had a priest, but they might have been doing a lot of other things in teaching the people. The priesthood, the Levites, are to instruct the people, not just collect offerings from them. Now, bring your sacrifice in here. We'll put them over here. No, we're bringing these for you to teach us what to do with them. And without the law or the word of God. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him. And he was found by them. In other words, when they began to seek, the law was opened up and the teaching began. And they began to understand some things. And thus, Ace is able to move, just like these guys up here in the north, are moving entire groups of people away from God because they're good leaders. Asa, who must also be a good leader, is able to move a mass of people towards God. Uh, in those days, it was not safe going back when they were forsaking God. It says the prophets recording. In those days, when they, they weren't turning towards God, the priests weren't teaching. In those days, it was not safe to travel about. Remember the days of the judges. For all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. <laughs> Just go across the border. There's your example. Um, uh, one nation was being crushed by another and one city by another because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Obed, the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin, from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. So it appears we're going to find out he's moving up here into Ephraim. His, his territory is expanding to the north, taking land from Israel. So he's, he's purging land. You have guys like Asa, Hezekiah, Josiah doing this kind of thing. Uh, he repaired the altar of the Lord that was... Now, here's the verse. I'm going to end with this. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. What do you mean? You mean in the temple right there in front of the building, the the, where the, the sacrifice, like, yeah, it kind of fallen apart and just kind of pushed the, it's like, are we going to fix this? 
And he, they hadn't. He takes the initiative. For some reason, this caused him, gave him momentum to go up and rebuild the altar that was in front of the, it's like, you let the altar fall apart in front of the temple of God? What do you, what's going on here? But he does. It says, uh, verse 10, they assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time, they sacrificed the Lord 700 heads of cattle, and they're going to have a little bit of a revival. This is right around 595 uh, maybe in the spring, they're going to have a little revival there. Again, things are going good for Asa. He goes off and follows God. God comes back and bless him and says, hey, you keep seeking him, you're going to find more. So he, he purchases his territory that he's, he's, he's captured. They have a, everybody comes back and worships, doing some good things. But if you look right here in Chronicles, I'm not going to read any more, but you've got the rest of chapter 15, and then you've got chapter 16, Asa's last years. And talks about some things right here. And if you look at verse 7, we'll go here next week. There's going to be a prophet come to him again and say, hey, listen. Because he's going to have some trouble with Baasha with this, or this border. And instead of trusting God, he's going, to get, he's going to look up here at the north and get scared. This is one thing. Being attacked by the Egyptians, the pagans, that's one thing. But up here, I don't know. So he's going to send some money. Up to Ben Haydad and said, Do me a favor. We attack them from the north. We've got a covenant. And then when you attack from the north, they'll take off the pressure here. And the prophet's going to show up and say, Yeah, that was not the right thing to do. That was not what got you here. That's not how you won this battle. You don't go out, and again, we go back to this. You don't start playing chess, start manipulating. You do things the right way. You trust God, you work hard, you do it the right way. And when pressure comes, you seek God says, I've done my job. Now I need your help. But when you start sending money around trying to manipulate peace like you're playing a chess game, God says, okay, I'm done. Good luck in the chess game against me because you're going to be playing chess and get some very powerful players, and they're going to beat you every time. So in other words, Ace is going to start playing chess. Remember when David played chess? The political game of chess trying to move things around? Always got burnt and burnt people with him, I mean, as far as hurting people. Asa has not played that game. He's sought God, done what is right. He's worked hard. He's taking things matters in his own hands, but he hasn't tried to manipulate people to get God's job done. He just did it. Anyway, you're going to see him drift away from that. And it's kind of a sad ending, but it's a humble ending. We all live these lives. We all have these moments of victory. We all get pressured by the world to start playing that chess game and start drifting away. I mean, all of us. It's just, it's, we're, none of us are immune to it. And Asa uh, is a king that's going to fall into that. Okay, I'm going to pray, and then I'm done. I do appreciate your time. I thank you for being here. Father, we come to you tonight again, and we thank you for the Word of God. We ask that it would speak to us. We thank you that your Spirit does lead us and guide us through your Word, through our lives, through the days. And we ask that you would continue to be there for us. We ask that we would be encouraged by each other's presence, be encouraged by the Word, encouraged by your Spirit to seek you. And, Father, we do rejoice, especially tonight, that we know that if we will seek you, we will be, that we will find you that you are there revealing yourself to us, that if we'll lift up our heads, if we'll open our eyes, if we will knock, we will, be, we will find you, and the, and the doors will be open, and the things we're seeking will be found. We do thank you again for being faithful to us and, and, and always surrounding us with your love and your protection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for your time. Amen.